and through books and through reading and through really just the word of what, what does Jesus say? And so what we have, what you have in the picture of the Bible, right? The Bible can be summed up in three words. God with us. God with us. From the beginning of the garden all the way to Revelation, he's making a way. From Genesis 3, when we fall, he's making a way that we could get back to him. God with us. And the whole Bible, if you, if you read it as a macro level, the Old Testament looks at Jesus. It's all about Jesus, this coming Messiah, this coming King, this coming redemption that we can fix our eyes on, that we don't always have to be persecuted. We don't always have to be without, right, that He's coming. And then in the Gospels, He comes, and then everything after that looks back on Jesus. What did He say? What did He do? How did He tell us how to live? How did He show us how to be? That we would be like Him. And so when we talk about discipleship, when we talk about how do we grow, how do we get into that next level, how do we uh, mature and grow in this world for the kingdom, for the king, it's through what he says. If there's anything that you read in the Bible, and this is my challenge to you, and this is what we're going to be going through in the class, if there's anything in the Bible that you read and you struggle to read it, and you're like, I don't know what book or what chapter, read the words in red. Read what Jesus says. Read what Jesus tells you first. Because he's, gonna, he's poignant and he cuts like a knife. He'll tell you this is the way to live. This is what the kingdom's like. This is how to get there. This is how to love your neighbor. This is how to deal with your enemies. This is how to deal with riches and money. This is how you get in. This is how you're exalted. This is how you gain a reward that you could rule and reign with me for eternity. Discipleship is a call on our lives. It's an invitation on our lives. And it calls us, we're going to read in a little bit, it calls us to give up everything. And so through this week, as I prepped this sermon and as I was thinking about what's going on in the world right now, I read this article on Facebook and I shared it, maybe some of you saw, but, but the underground church in Kabul, really the underground church in Afghanistan is being martyred right now. And the, this, this thing that got posted on Facebook was from an insider and I have a, a friend that, that is over there and, 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 and they basically just said, hey, they, they were on the phone with these people, this, this underground church, and they heard the gunshots, they heard the screams, and these people on the phone said, hey, we're, we're ready, we, we felt your prayers, we have a spiritual boldness, a, a supernatural boldness, even our kids are saying, mom, we won't deny Jesus. And they were murdered. That's discipleship playing out. When Jesus says, are you willing to give everything, that's what it looks like. And what it stems from is this perspective to see this world for what it is. To see this world for what it's not really and to see it, heaven and eternity as our home, as our goal, as our, the kingdom that we're going, where God has prepared a place for us and, and, and where every tear is wiped away. This is our test. This is our crucible. This is our battle. And so my question was, like, could, could you give up everything? Could I give up everything? And I've often said like, a, a good litmus test in your life is, are you afraid to die? If you're afraid to die, and my thing was, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm afraid to die for the sake of my kids. I don't want my kids to grow up without me. I, I mean, I want to see Daniel and Ivy grow up. I want, to, I want to sow into their lives and love on them and teach them. But I had to come to grips with this idea that, that if I'm not trusting my kids to God, then they're an idol for me. He loves them more than I do. And if it's my time to go, if he calls me out of this world, it's because he knows their life too and their history and their future and the day that they live and die. And so why am I not trusting him with this? And so he began to prune me. And so what I want to do is I want to start out. If you guys have your Bibles, let's open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says this. 11 through 15 says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on that foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the fire. I love this verse because I feel like it puts all of life into perspective. The foundation is Jesus. And the idea is this. We're all building something in this life. No matter what, whether it's good or bad. And Jesus talks about in, in, in Matthew 7, he talks about the, right, the parable of the two houses. Right? He says one was built on the rock and one was built on the sand. The only foundation in this world is Jesus Christ. 
When you don't have Jesus, what you have is a lacking of a foundation. Sand is not a foundation. So on that foundation, when we become Christians, when we come unto salvation, we have an option. What are we going to build on that foundation? What are we going to build on what we call Jesus and what we call ourselves as Christians? What do we build? Because there's a day of judgment. There's a day where we will stand before our king and it's all going to get lit. It's all going to get lit on fire. And it's going to be tested. Did you do it for me? Did you do it for love? Did you do it to reach people? Did you do it for pure motives and intentions? Or did you do it to be seen? Did you do it for your gain? Did you do it for selfish ambitions and purposes? We are building something. We are building something. And it, and it, and it, it attains a reward. It achieves for us a reward. And, and you could give me, I kid you not, I could give you every dollar that exists in this world. Every, every riches. It, it wouldn't even hold a candle to the, to, to the reward he's talking about right here. A reward in eternity is eternal. It never ends. It never goes away. It's not some piece of monopoly money like this life. This life is temporary. I gave a rope analogy once. Uh, from Francis Chan that I love and it, it was this idea that I took this rope that went out the door and I said if you imagine that this rope went out into the universe right in, into eternity and never ended and I held up the end that was taped and I said this little taped end represents your life on this earth why are we so consumed by this little taped part why are we so consumed by this 80 years in the light of billions of years with our king this is our testing grounds this is our battle this is our call And so I love, the, the title of the sermon is called Follow Me. And it's this idea, if you guys have seen The Chosen, it's this idea that when Jesus goes to, to meet his disciples or pick his disciples, he, he says, follow me. So he goes to four fishermen on the, on the Sea of Galilee and he says, follow me. And, and Peter, Andrew, James, and John leave their dad, leave their boats, and they drop everything and they follow him. He goes to a man named Levi in a tax booth and he says, hey, follow me. He drops everything, he leaves and he follows and becomes Matthew. And then you have this, the, the other side of that coin is a story that Jesus tells. There's a rich young ruler who loves God. He says he's, he's done everything. He's followed Jesus his whole, or God his whole life. He's, he's, he's kept the precepts of the Bible, the Old Testament. And Jesus says, there's one thing that you lack. Sell everything that you have and give to the poor. And then come follow me. And it says he goes away sad because he had much and he didn't want to give it away. I often think... I love, I'm, I'm just going to use Peter for example. I, I love Peter because Peter's jacked up. Peter is a messed up dude. And, and what you get is this, this gruff fisherman, this guy that lives on the Sea of Galilee. He's not a nice guy. Probably. Like, he, like he's probably pretty, pretty manly, pretty masculine. And what you see is this guy has nothing going for him. He's a fisherman. That's cool. I mean, that's a cool job if that's what you're into. But like, really, he's got nothing going for him. And this one day, this carpenter, the son of God comes and says, hey, follow me. And it changes everything. It changes his name. It changes his, 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 his destiny, his, his, his uh, per, I can't think of the word, trajectory. It changes everything. Right? There's this scene when, once Jesus rises that Peter preaches this message, probably the most powerful message ever preached because it says 5,000 people came to be saved. A fisherman! There's this call on your life to be more than you could have ever dreamed you could be. With the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, there is no limit to what we can become with Jesus. And then you see the rich young ruler who walks away. He had riches. He had everything he wanted in his life. But all we, all we learn from him is that what not to do. What not to do. Because as much as he might have been rich in this world, he's not rich in heaven probably, not like the disciples. It says, Jesus literally says to the 12 disciples, you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel in eternity. That's a reward that we will rule and reign with the king if we accept this invitation of discipleship. Listen, discipleship is a choice. And I think a lot of people think discipleship goes hand in hand with salvation. It doesn't. You can be saved without ever following Jesus after that point. It's going to be kind of a crumb bum way to live, but, but it says that salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, and it's a free gift. It's not by works. You can't earn it. So you choosing to follow after Jesus and do these things just because you believe, it's attaining a reward. And I've talked about investing in eternity. I've, I've talked about how this life is temporary, and this is our one opportunity to invest. And we'd be stupid not to. 
We'd be stupid to spend this life on ourselves and our pleasures and our comforts and our, what we want and what we think we need and what we think makes us feel good in the minute because Jesus is calling us to die to ourselves. Discipleship is a choice. It's an invitation. And it's an outworking of your salvation. So our main text is going to be out of Luke 14, 25. And we're going to kick it off in 25. So if you have Bibles, turn over there. It says this. Now great crowds accompanied, accompanied him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I love this verse because it always messes with people and they don't understand it. Um, it's very simple what he's saying here is if you love anything more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. It doesn't mean that you're not worthy of salvation. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It doesn't mean that I'm not for you. It does mean, though, that you're not worthy to follow me. Kind of like the rich young ruler. If you don't give up everything, if you don't see my gifts as rightly as what they are, I gave you your children. I gave you your spouse. I gave you your career, your job. I gave it all to you. Don't covet these things. Don't have these things as idols in your life. If you don't put me above on the throne of your heart of all of these things I've given you, then you're not worthy of me. You're finding your hope, your identity, everything in these temporary things when I need to be on the throne. And that's what he's saying. If you don't love me the most, if I'm not number one, even above your own life, if you're not willing to... to no, we're going to read it. Let's go. <laughs> and then he says, 27 says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And that's what he's saying. They knew what it meant when he's telling these people this crowds are following him. They knew what it meant to bear your cross. They've seen Roman persecution. They've seen Roman executions. They know. They knew that he was talking about death and the foreshadowing. That he, they didn't know he was foreshadowing, but they knew what it meant. It meant give up everything. Die to yourself. This is how he talks to the crowds. He says, it's me or it's not. You choose. And what it looks like to pick up your cross is that every day you wake up. And we talked about this last week. Pastor Alfredo talked about this last week. That we are workers. That we are soldiers for the king. That every day we wake up with that in mind, that we wake up dying to ourselves, wake up, hey Jesus, what do you want to do today? What are the opportunities? Let me focus on you. Let me put myself to death again today. This is what we read last week. It's 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21. It says this. I love this verse. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You guys get that? Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm going to tell you a quick story that I hate telling, but it's good. Um, I've told it before in, in, in a sermon, so I'm sorry if this is the second time you've heard it. Uh, I was, as a, as a young kid, I was... Um, exposed to pornography at a really young age and and it kind of marked my life sort of through my teenage years and my formidable years even when I became a Christian it was a thing that I struggled with a lot um, and it was something I tried to give up over and over and over God take this break this take this out of me I hate this I feel yucky I feel gross help me help me help me and sometimes I would feel his grace and I would feel his strength and then I would go back and do it again and it became this process of me being like God I'll never want to do that again and then I would do it and finally I broke and I said, God, help me with this. And I heard his voice almost as loud as you're hearing me. He said, help yourself. You're choosing to do this. You are choosing every time to, to enter into your sin and do this thing in, in, in place of me. And I had to realize it's my self-control. It's my discipline. Because listen, discipline and discipleship go hand in hand. I have to control my flesh. I have to control my urges. I have to control everything about me that I would honor my king. I am a battle guard. I am a son of the king. You are a daughter or a son of your king. We don't get to just wild out like the rest of the world. I said like Prince Harry, right? He doesn't get to go wild out at bars and stuff. He represents his family. He represents his daddy or his, really his mom, I guess, huh? He represents his position. And so God started to rework that in my heart. He said, if you want to be a vessel used for special purposes, you need to cleanse yourself. You need to take these things out. If you want to go to the next level, then you need to, then you need to seek me. You need to pursue me. You need to cut these, this death out of your life. 
And slowly but surely, he, he changed my heart towards it. As I fought, as I resisted, as I fought, as I resisted, he changed my heart towards it. And towards women, and towards life, and towards all of it. And it's amazing now. But it took me taking the work and the steps to say, I'm, I don't want to disappoint my daddy. I know he sees what I do. I know he sees my heart. I know what he sees behind closed doors. I don't want to let him down. Cleanse. We, we are called to cleanse ourselves. And when we do, we can kind of almost control, like you can control your own spiritual growth. Did you know that? How much time you spend in the Word, how much time you spend in prayer, how much time you spend with God, you, you will grow exponentially. I know 80-year-olds that aren't as spiritual, spiritually mature as me, and that's not me being cocky or confident. I'm saying they, they just have done nothing with their salvation. Their whole life they've sat on it. They've gone to church Christmas and Easter, and they never did anything. But as you pursue God, as you seek God, He will make you into something you could never have dreamed you could be. And he goes on in verse 28 uh, in Luke 14 and says this, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not, s s first, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet the one who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Everything in, in this life is God's. And when you can stop your, your pursuit of like the world and, and the things that you think you need and the things that make you feel good and realize that literally you've done nothing. You've, you've, returned, you've achieved nothing for yourself. You've earned nothing. Like you, you were born because God let you be born. You were put in America because God allowed you to be here, right? In the freedom. You, you were placed with your family or even the, the hard circumstances. Whatever it was that God needed you to do to be who you were. He gave you your job, your kids, your spouse. You, you had to be there at a certain point, right? Like God maneuvered you through this life. Everything is his. And so when he asks us to give up everything, he says, it's all... He's not... Like, <laughs> there's this image of a teddy bear. I wish I would have put it up. There's this little girl with a teddy bear. And she's like, she's holding onto this thing. And the dad is standing there and he's like trying to take it from her. He's like reaching for it. And behind his back, he's got a giant teddy bear. It's like four feet tall. And he's trying to take this little one so he can give her this big one. And she's like clinging on to it like, Dad, don't take this thing from me. Discipleship is a choice. And what happens is when God invites you into, in, in, into this process, what he says is, is you're never going to be the same. Oh, I lost my place. It's like this. Uh, Jesus tells a parable uh, of uh, the pearl of great price, right? And he says there's this field. There's this field where this treasure was buried. And this man came and he found this treasure in the field. And he says when he found it, he sold everything that he had. And he went and bought the field. Right? It was so much more valuable, the thing that he had found, than everything else that he had had, that he sold everything just to buy that field. He didn't say, oh, that's a pretty treasure. Like, I'm just going to come back Christmas and Easter to look at it. Right? Oh, I just, I just want to know about the treasure. Like, no, he said, I want that. I need that. I found the intrinsic thing. I found my hope, my peace, my identity. I found my purpose. I found what I was meant to do. I found my, my home and eternity, where I'm going, the truth, the answer. I found it. Here it is. And he sells everything. And then he goes to the rest of the world. He says, hey, look, come here. Look, look, look at what I found. You don't have to struggle with these things. You don't have to be in despair. Like, you, you can follow Jesus. You can have this treasure. You don't have to be dealing with the same monotony and fear and anxiety and stress and, and loneliness and insecurity that you've been dealing with all these years. Find your identity in the King. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. He says that we are going to rule and reign with him in eternity. That there is a reward. That he is coming to give us a reward based on what we do in this life. We are disciples of the King. And listen, we live in a time right now in the world where the world needs our light. The world is getting disgusting and dark. And I've never, I always say this, it's not Republican against Democrat, black versus white. It's Satan versus God. It's evil versus good. That's what this world is right now. And we stand for our King. We stand united as a family. We're brothers and sisters in the same battle and we have to fight for each other. The Bible says, go and make disciples of all the world. 
That was Jesus' last commission before he died. Go into all the world and make disciples. Teaching them to preach because Satan's army is, 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 is well oiled. It's a well oiled machine. Satan's people, Satan's dominions. People are prone to sin. They're prone to wickedness. We have to fight to shine the light. We have to fight to be cities on hills. A city on a hill that light can't shine out. We have to fight to be lighthouses in this time. Because if we're not, where are they going to go? The world needs you. The world needs us. There's a reason that you're sitting here today listening to this sermon. There's a reason that God is telling you this, that there's something on your heart. There's a reason that you're here. It's not an accident. There's 7 billion people. You could be anywhere. God is calling you, and this is an invitation to go deeper to knowing Him, to knowing yourself, to knowing more about who you are, eternity, where you're going, the truth of everything, and how to love people well, how to forgive. And so this is how God often works. We're called to discipleship. And he says, count the cost. And he says, give up everything. And, and so it's this idea that like, we're like, okay, God, I'm ready to follow you. I'll give up everything. I, I count as yours. I surrender it to you. I submit it all to you. And you know what he does sometimes, most of the time? He'll then start to break off your hopes in the world. He calls it pruning. He'll then begin to cut all the things off of you that don't glorify him. And that are keeping you in the darkness and keeping you away from him. So he's going to come to you and he's going to say, hey, you know that bad relationship you're in that you're clinging to? It's not for me. I don't want it. I'm going to cut it off. Oh, you know that, that job or that money or that pursuit or that dream or that hope that you have that doesn't glorify me, that's about you? I'm going to cut it off because it's, 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 it's poisoning you. It's poisoning you away. You've been, so, so culturally, we've all been programmed through our lives to, to think that we need to feed us. It needs to be about us, me. What, I, what can I get? What can people do for me? What, can, what, what My comfort, my joy, my peace, my security, my whatever. And God says, no, 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 no. Like, Kingdom economics is your last. The, the, the greatest in the kingdom is the least. The first in the kingdom is the last. The highest in the kingdom is the lowest. Here. And so what he does is he, he, he'll, he'll remove our hopes. And so we saw that in the fire. A lot. We saw that in the fire. God just cutting things off of people. And these seasons like... Like Alfredo and Debbie, Pastor Alfredo lost their house and then Debbie broke her leg. We lost our house and then I broke my back. And it was like this, this, this season of like, and it's just this season of like, God, what are we doing? Like, what are you doing? And I was angry and yelling and, and cussing and mad like, because I was so flabbergasted, like flustered. But he was he, like in this process, in hindsight, now I can look back and be like, dang, I had a lot of crap. Sorry, excuse me. I had a lot of stuff in me that had to go. I had a lot of garbage. Like, I had a lot of built up stuff that was still about me. A lot of stuff I was still trying to control. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be so filthy, financially rich because I thought security came from that that God had to say, no, 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 let me make you poor so you understand everything comes from me. And it hurt. Man, it hurt to have my control ripped out from me. When I, when I was in a situation I could no longer control, I had no ability, I had a broken back, no job, a brand new baby, dogs in a hotel, like I had nothing and he had to bring me to that point to say, it's not about you. Watch what I do now. Trust me, I'm your dad. And that's what we say, like, if we have a good dad, he's trustworthy. And that's why he says, come as little children. Trust me. I know your life. I know the plans I have for you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I am making you into something you couldn't dream of. I'm preparing a, a house in my father's, a place for you in my father's house. I prepared you an attorney to rule and reign with me on behalf of my kingdom. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this reward. It's our dad. <laughs> And we need to see rightly that He loves us more than we love ourselves and that He is for us even when the world seems like it's falling apart. And so in this discipleship, what we often get is you get two responses. When our hopes are dashed in the world, we either get angry at God and we say, God, how dare you? How dare you take the things away from me that I wanted? How dare you take that thing that, I, that, 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 that defined me? How dare you take away that thing that I was hoping for? And they leave. They'll walk away because God was there to serve them. It wasn't about God. Or our second response is, oh my God, this hurts. This sucks. But I trust you. And I know that you're real. And I know that you're for me. And I know you're my dad. And I know that you would never leave me. And I know what the Bible says. And I know what fellowship group says. And I know what I heard at, at Bible study. And I remember what I heard in church. And I know that, that you've never forsaken me. And, and that I've always, you've always been there through the valley of the shadow of death. And it allows us to go deeper and lean into God in our trials. And that's what Mary was talking about. He says, rejoice in your trials. Because they're 
Your testing produces perseverance. It's producing growth. It's producing character in us. And so he allows us to grow. He allows things to be broken off. That we would be his. That we wouldn't be a dead, dying tree. I want to close with this. Discipleship costs every temporary thing you have on this earth. Everything. But you will gain back so much more than you could have ever dreamed. And it's not like he's going to take your kids, he's going to take your things, he's going to take... It's that he's going to show you who you are. He's going to show you the gifts and the talents and the uniqueness that he placed inside of you to be a body, the body of Christ, the member of the body of Christ in this life that you can live out your purpose. That you can love people where you are. You have unique abilities. You have unique opportunities in relationships that no one else has. Unique connections that God has placed you in the positions and the, and the jobs and the careers and, the, and the, wherever it is in Chico, California or wherever. That you would be his light. That you would be his disciple. And so I've often thought about this and I just saw something on Facebook last week and I, oh, I started crying when I read it. There's this day coming when we're going to go to heaven. And it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and that God will be glorified and that we will be glorified with Him. And I, I can't help but think there's this day coming that, that we'll stand in heaven and, and we're going to stand before our King and He's going to say, hey, come here. Let me show you all the people that are here because of you. Let me show you all the people that you reached, that you loved, that you were with me, that you discipled, that you were selfless towards. Let me show you everybody here that can claim that they're here because of something you said or did, something I led you into. That's treasure in heaven. That's rewards in heaven. To see my boy, to see this girl like, ah, you're here, like, ah, like, there's nothing better than that. Because there's nothing else that transcends from this life except souls. How do we love people? How are we loving people in this current climate? Are we pissed off about the, the, the po politics? Are we mad about COVID? Are we mad about freedom loss? Are we mad? Are we arguing, debating, quarreling? Or are we seeing that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood? We wrestle against principalities of darkness in the heavenly realms. And it's our job to shine the light into those places, to pray for those people, to love on those people, to turn the other cheek even when they're coming against us. Because we stand for our king and we know that our home is not here. You were made. God made, broke the mold when he made you. So if you're ready, if you feel this call on your life, if, you're, if you've been in this position where you're like, God, I, I just want to go to the next level. I, I don't know how to grow. I feel stagnant. I feel plateaued. I'm inviting you next week. We're going to start this discipleship class. Again, it's been something that's been on our hearts for a long time to say, how do we train up our church? How do we teach them who they are and their identity and then send them out to be the warriors and the workers of God? To be in the world, not of the world. To see this life for what it is. If you're ready, this class, I, I just, I made a list. I'm going to read it to you. So next week, first week, it's going to be 8.45 to 9.30. It's going to be every two weeks, second and fourth Sunday. Next week, we're, it's, it's going to be all about identity. Who are you? Who did God make you to be uniquely? We're going to do spiritual gifts tests. It's going to be, I want this to be hands-on. I want this to be something you take back into your home, back into your family, back into your workplace, into the world, and say, like, this is how to be Jesus. And I know now because I know what he says. So we're going to do a spiritual gift test next week to say, what are the gifts that God gave you? Your passions, your talents, your dreams, they're not in you by an accident. God placed them uniquely as you are a part of his body, uniquely a part of it. Where is he calling you to serve? What is he calling you to do in this life? Because it supersedes everything else you do. It informs everything else you do. And then we're going to, you guys are going to love this. There's this scene where Jesus reaches out and touches a leper. Right? His disciples are rushing back and, and Jesus goes and he cleanses this man with leprosy. And I love that scene because this guy had probably never been touched, or at least for years. And here's the empathy, the love, the kindness of his king to come and say, I love you and I'm here and be healed. Jesus, on the night that he died, he washed his 12 disciples' feet. Judas, even Judas, the one that was about to betray him, he washed his feet. And they had nasty feet, y'all. They wore sandals. Like... But I had to ask myself, like, am I ready to do that? Am I ready to be a disciple of God? And so we're going to wash each other's feet. We're going to wash each other's feet. We're going to take opportunities to pray for strangers. 
We're going to talk about, here I wrote it down, we're going to talk about life of prayer, studying the word, spiritual warfare, forgiveness, wisdom, relationships, loving our enemies, the end times, the rapture, the micro and macro perspective of life, the antichrist, the last world kingdom, aliens. We're going to talk about all of it because we have to be informed. We have to know our, our enemy. We have to know what's going on in the world around us, that we could be a vanguard, that we could be battle guards, that we could be an army for our king. Ready to shine the light. Ready for every good work. I'm so calm. Come next week. Make it a habit to come. Exactly what Mary said. I call it being under the faucet. Place yourself under the faucet. If you want more of God, place yourself where He is. And that when He turns it on, man, you're just drenched. So I'm going to pray. We're going to do an altar call. I don't know. Pastor Alfredo will come up. And I don't know if our prayer team is here. But if you want to pray, if there's anything on your heart, Man, come and leave it at the cross. Come and give it to, to the king. And if not, what I want you guys to be doing over this week is pray about this class. Pray about it. It's time because Jesus is the one that says count the cost lest you aren't able to finish. So if you're in this place in your life, you're like, God, I'm not ready. There's still a lot of things I need to work out. Then maybe it's not time. But if you're ready to go to the next level, if you're ready to see God change you and make you new and, and, and change your trajectory of your life and your family and what it meant to be Christian and what it meant to be in this life and this earth, then come and see what He's got for you. This is an invitation into discipleship. He says, come and follow me. And then He says, make disciples of all the earth. And that's what we're doing. Let's pray.